Welcome to Crash Concepts, where the economy, energy, and the environment are explored. Up next, fresh ideas and insights into the factors that are driving the world and shaping your future. Presenting information you can't afford to live without, here's Chris Martinson. Welcome to this Peak Prosperity Podcast. I am your host, Chris Martinson. It is June 29, 2017, and today we are going to be talking with a guest that, frankly, should have been on this program a long time ago and many times since. If you are at all interested in financial markets and conditions and where this is all headed, this podcast is for you. We are going to be talking about oil, shale oil specifically, debt, financial bubbles, precious metals with Steve St. Angelo, the prolific independent researcher and financial analyst and writer and the operator of the excellent srsrockoreport.com website. Of course, you can find Steve's work widely across the web as well. And one part of Steve's work that I love the most, of course, is his continued focus on the impacts of energy return on energy invested, or EROI. He makes it one of the most important aspects of his energy research. He ties it into the precious metals. And of course, as you know, EROI is everything in this story. Steve, I'm so excited to finally have you on the program. Yeah, Chris, uh, I appreciate it. I've been, it's been, uh, I love your site. Uh, you've got the crash course. That's, that's, the, that's the starter of getting anybody up to speed of what's going on. So there's so much happening now. It's going to be a great conversation. Well, thank you. I really admire your work as well, and I read it religiously. It's just top-notch, uh, mainly because you say things I happen to really agree with. Steve, let's start here. As a means of easing into this energy return on invested topic, uh, which we certainly want to get to. Let's begin with this opening sentence of a recent article of yours. I'm quoting now. While the mainstream media continues to put out hype, the technology will bring on abundant energy supplies for the foreseeable future. The global oil and gas industry is actually cannibalizing itself just to stay alive. Okay, end quote. Steve, you've got my attention. How is the industry cannibalizing itself? Well, you see, this is what's interesting. Uh, if we go back to 2008, we had a lot of trouble in the housing market, in the, in the uh, banking industry, the investment banking industry disappeared. Uh, Lehman, Bro- Lehman Brothers, as you know, was around since the Civil War, and now it, dis- it disappeared. So we had huge problems with the financial industry, with the housing market, with the auto industry. But, uh, and so it was a huge bubble, and uh, it was actually imploding. And so then they came in and propped it up. Now, in 2008, the energy system or the energy industry was still in pretty good shape. They were, make, they were still making pretty good money. Well, after 2008, with the zero interest rates and the massive money printing, we, we brought on shale. And that's when really shale started to come on uh, in, in the back end, Eagle Ford. And so we started producing all this shale and what happened was uh, it, it, the, the industry really didn't make any money doing it. And so what they did is they, uh, they took the, the funds, the investment funds, uh, they spent all this capital, but their capital expenditures, and if we look at their free cash flow over the past 10 years, the majority of them really didn't make any free cash flow positive. There was negative free cash flow. So then the debts increased. So now what's happened the price of oil went over $100 for 2011 to 2014, the middle of 2014. Uh, some of these uh, shale producers actually had more debt. They increased their debt even higher during the $100 uh, price. You'd think they would be making more money out of $100. Well, then everything really fell apart. And when the price fell below 100 in the middle of 2014, and then it really fell to a bottom by 2016 to like $29. And so what's happened with the price now in the 40, 50 range, this is well below what the shale industry really can make money doing, even, they, even though they say that they can produce uh, uh, shale oil at 20 to 30 or 40. Uh, so what they're doing now is they're totally cutting their capital expenditures. And so it's, it's like they're, they're cutting their capital expenditures. They're cutting exploration in longer term things like deep water, and they're moving to more shale like in the Permian. So what's happening now is it's like a cannibalization. They're basically living off their seed corn, which is their, their, uh, their discoveries. They're no longer spending enough money 
to add more discoveries to continue growing or to continue uh, offsetting their, their production. So this is what I call the, cannibaliz the cannibalization of the system. And we know it's happening because you may have quoted this. Last year, the, uh, the global conventional oil production in the world was about 25 billion barrels. Well, they only found 2.4 billion last year. And that's, that's less than 10%. Now, what's even worse than that, the average for the past 15 years, the, the, uh, global, the world oil industry has been discovering about 9 new million barrels, new uh, billion barrels of oil. So we're only discovering about a little more than a third of what we're consuming in conventional oil for the last 15 years. So there's a lot more that's going on. And lastly, let me say this. Uh, the EIA showed that in 2014, and I think it's the 68 publicly, uh, a public, the larger publicly traded companies, and this is the data that they used. Well, in 2014, there was about 115 billion barrels of liquid reserves, and it, it has been steadily moving up. And, but what happened is in the last two years, it's fallen below 100 billion for the first time. So what we're seeing now is about a 14, 15% decline in, in reserves, oil reserves, liquid reserves of these companies. So when you look at that, you see a whole, a totally different market now. And now these companies are, they are saddled with debt, which they didn't have in 2008. So this is why, Chris, I see this, this whole energy industry now is, it's cannibalizing itself. And, and so I think going forward, I, I see the oil and gas industry in big trouble. Well, this is uh, all just fantastic data. Let me just pull out that one piece. Um, I don't have more recent data that I could find. This is a BIS report that noted that from 2006 to 2014, global oil and gas industry, this isn't just U.S. shale, this is a global oil and gas industry, debt tripled from about $1.1 trillion to over $3 trillion. So a tripling of debt from 2016 to 14. So, so we as investors might say, well, that's okay. You know, companies that have opportunities will will go into debt. I'm not I'm not an anti debt person at all. If you've got self liquidating, productive enterprise, cash flowing things to to uh, borrow against, that can be good use of money. But so they borrowed a couple extra trillion, and now we wander over and say, well, how's their output doing? And there we're going to notice that between 2006 and 2014, there hasn't been a tripling of output uh, or a doubling of output or any real noticeable increase in output um, across the globe. It's a, it's a few percent. We're sort of in a zone. Uh, and, and so I look at that massive amount of debt. So let me just run a simple number. Uh, Three trillion is 3,000 billion. So let's imagine um, that, uh, you know, oil is at uh, $30 a barrel. So I can just calculate that, you know, right in my head. That means that something like three years of oil production has to be sold uh, to uh, just pay back the debt. Now, that's troubling to me, but you know, you, you raised what I think is just the big red flag in all of this to focus it down back in the shale business. Tell me how many years they've had positive free cash flow after running. So, I mean, the shale business, it should be pretty simple, right? And and the, the majors are focused there now because you punk, punch a hole in the ground and it flows very quickly. This well depletes within uh, three years, 85%. So after you run that model for a few years, you really ought to have a good sense of your cash flows. This should be spitting out cash like crazy. Steve, how many years has the shale industry produced positive free cash flow? Well, I've seen a few charts, and when they uh, it was at like the top 15 uh, of all the, uh, the the EMP producers, and when we look at them, some of them made free cash flow throughout the years, uh, but when you average them all together, since 2000 uh, since 2009, the industry as a whole net hasn't made any free cash flow. So uh, and so when you look at that, you, you say, well, you know, it, it didn't it didn't make it money it was supposed to make and so when you understand that well what did that do to their balance sheets like you said it, it has doubled and tripled their debt but what is an amazing statistic and this is what you just spoke about the debt when you have that much debt now on your balance sheet you have to service it and i'm looking at a chart the eia put out now from 2012 to 2014 
these, uh, the U.S. shale oil and gas companies, and let's just say the oil and gas companies, Exxon Mobil is included in this, um, their, their interest payment on their debt was about 25% of their operating cash about 25 percent for the last three years well when the price of uh, oil fell below a hundred dollars in 2014 and in the last time they did this this statistic was at the third quarter of 2016 it's now 75 percent so they're paying like a person who's got a credit card they can't afford to pay down their credit card all they're doing is paying the month the minimum monthly interest payment which might be a hundred dollars or two hundred dollars the energy companies now are paying, at that point in time, 75% of their operating cash just to pay their interest expense. Now, if we go back to the same time in 2004, I went back and looked at the data, Chris. When we go back to 2004 and look at the, when the price of oil was about the same, $40, $50, uh, their interest expense was 25%. So what's changed is the debt. And as you said, we've added all this debt into the energy industry, and it really hasn't been productive. It's, it's kept, let's say, it's kept the oil supply uh, uh, elevated, but it really isn't profitable. So I think going forward, uh, while some analysts think this, this thing will continue to kind of like go on for a while, I think we, there's, a, there's a probability we could see uh, more of a, uh, a quicker disintegration of the oil industry if prices do not recover above 60 or $70. So, and it looks like we're not going to see a higher price for at least the next year. You know, I was reading through uh, chats at the bottom of, of an article about shale oil. I think it was the comments left under a Wall Street Journal article. And somebody was like, hey, I thought you got, you know, the, it was about how, how allegedly they're, they're, you know, profitable at 50, now 40, now 30. They're profitable at these ridiculous numbers of uh, dollars per barrel. And, and there's some complexity under that, which we can maybe get to later. But a commenter under there was like, oh, I, you know, I thought you guys said that, you know, this is proof that, that this industry works because you guys said there were going to be these bankruptcy filings and there weren't. But the truth is, by my last count, there were over 70 bankruptcy filings. Um, uh, no, I'm sorry, $70 billion worth of, of bankruptcy filings across 100 companies. That's kind of been flying under the radar, I think. There have been tens of billions of losses that have accumulated uh, in this industry already, but it's not really well known, is it? No, it isn't well known. And then there's another excellent chart put out by Bloomberg. It's called the debt wall. And it, it, it's basically the debt is really bonds. And these are bonds that are below investment grade because, as we all know, uh, pension plans, insurance funds, uh, or whatever, mutual funds, these, these fund investors are trying to find yield because we, they need a higher yield, 7 6 7 8% to allow the, the pension system or whatever fund that they're investing in to actually be uh, viable going forward. Well, they can't get that with anything because there's zero interest rates. So we're, they have to go for these risky assets. And, and one of the risky assets was shale oil and gas. And according to this chart, there was about $27 billion of debt due in 2016. Now, that's going to balloon to $65 billion this year. Then it shoots up to 110 billion next year. By 2020, it's 230 billion, and it keeps rising. By 2022, it's uh, 265 billion. So, this debt wall is is this debt that's going to be due. And so now, are they going to roll it over? Well, if if the interest rates rise, that's not a good deal. And so it just becomes more expensive to service this debt. So I think the issue is. Uh, these companies that say they can produce oil in the in the Permian now for twenty or thirty or forty dollars, it, it's pure nonsense. It's looking it's looking in a vacuum. It's looking at how much they can uh, drill the well, how much cash flow they get, but they're totally uh, disregarding a lot of costs and and all the debt now. So who's going to pay the debt? Like you said, there's three trillion in debt and you've got to make you've got to make a profit to pay back your debt well the, the companies right now are not making profits and you know we can even discuss saudi arabia they continue to liquidate their foreign exchange reserves because they're not making the money now that even though they, they have a lower production cost than uh the rest of the world they use that to finance the national uh the national government and, and so they need a much higher price or they have to liquidate their reserves 
and they continue to do that even though the price of oil has recovered you know this year and it's it's always at fifty dollars but they still continue to sell off reserves to offset a lower oil price well i want to get to saudi arabia in more detail in just a second but but let me back up you said 75 percent of operating income for a, a tranche of these companies is just going to debt service at this at current rates is that right that's according to the EIA, yes. Yeah, 75% currently. Um, and, and so then we have to look at the total amount of debt that's outstanding. And of course, the, the companies have been just issuing into this wildly free uh, financial conditions that, that like never freer. I thought Greenspan was just a, an enormously destructive individual. I couldn't believe what he did. And then Bernanke made him look like a piker. And now under Yellen, it's just, it's astonishing. So these shale companies have been raising debt and equity and uh, and just having no trouble at all, just hundreds of billions of dollars of debt and equity just flying out the door, people snapping it up. Um, but if we just take a, a, a quick example, you know, the last time I actually found a number, and, and Bloomberg, by the way, has not updated this number in about a year and a half, there were $350 billion of outstanding debt in the shale industry. So I just look at that and I say, well, you know, all things being equal and you look at um, you know, oil prices just rounding, if we call it $40 a barrel, that's not what you get at the wellhead with severance, with royalties, with da 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 da. Let's just pretend they're getting $30 um, a barrel. Well, at $300 billion, it means their next 10 billion barrels of production is just there to service the debt, not the interest on that debt, just to pay back the principal. And that's just an astonishing number. And given that, a simple math, I'm just always, I'm like flabbergasted that investors, air quotes, I'm waving them wildly, um, haven't sort of figured that out. But if you look at who's in this debt, which is mostly junk rated debt, we find that the $72 billion um, Franklin Income Fund is, has got uh, uh, about 4% mm, about of its portfolio in uh, energy junk debt. And you look at somebody like um, the Mainstay High Yield Corporate Bond Fund, uh, it's got about 10% of its holdings in these uh, in this high yield debt because again, like you said, they're chasing the yield. They need it, of course, in this weird, bizarre world that the central banks have manufactured. But when I look at those numbers, I just see massive losses have to be coming at some point. And the only possible rescue for this would be really, really high oil prices suddenly magically appearing. But barring that, they're really this just doesn't pencil out, does it? No, and I'm glad you, you see the thing is a lot of people talk about opinions and they give uh, their their idea and notions of what's going on and 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 it's good that you put up the numbers and because Continental Resources is like the poster child of ba of the back end they they're one of the larger oil producers in the back end now what's interesting about Continental Resources it's a perfect example of what's wrong with shale oil. Now, in, in like in 2007, they had they were paying 13 million a year for their interest expense. Fast forward to last year, they paid 321 million. That was their interest credit card payment. That's what they had to pay just to pay their interest payment. 320. That's a third of a billion dollars. They're forking out a third of a billion dollars, and it's to the like uh, these funds you just mentioned. That's what they're they're getting this this kind of interest payment uh, for their fund. So they paid a third of a billion last year, and the reason why they paid a third of a billion was because in 2007, Continental only had 165 million of debt. Now they've got 6.5 billion. So. To service that debt, they pay a, a higher interest rate, higher yield, and so this is this is uh, the uh, the ongoing issue. The issue is shale was really never profitable, and maybe some, maybe a very small percentage made some money. As an industry, it was never really profitable, and it it wouldn't have really grown, Chris. I don't think unless we had the Federal Reserve shoot interest rates down to zero. And then we had all the massive QE and central bank asset purchases. Without that, I don't think shale would have taken off. It was, it, it was because of that market intervention which allowed the price of oil to go up and which allowed shale oil to come online. I don't know if that can be done again. Do you? Oh, great question. I, I don't think it can. You know, right now, I, I understand the dynamic of the industry. It makes sense if if um, the way Wall Street is rewarding 
by throwing money, debt and equity at these shale companies is, is by production growth. That's all they're really measuring. And somehow in this, it's not a really confusing story, but somehow the details have gotten lost, which is, you know, here's a simple analysis I run. So I'll take somebody like, um, oh, I don't know, I've, I've done this um, uh, with, with just a couple of them where you just say, listen, what if they stopped right now? What if they just stopped? We can look at their daily production. We have to make some guesses about how many wells they drilled in, in which vintage years, 2011 on forward or whatever. And then we can apply a decline rate to those existing operations. We can say, okay, if we just stop this company right now, no more debt, no more equity, no more drilling new wells. And we just say, let it run. Is this, could this company A, pay back its debt and B, if it can, what kind of a return is left for the equity holders? And Steve, I run this over and over again, and unless I have something really wrong about the decline rates and the EURs or the ultimate recoverable resource in a, um, uh, in a well, unless I have something really badly wrong with my numbers, the answer is no, these companies are actually have negative net present values at this point. That's what I come up with. Well, you're right, and Art Berman does a great job. You've interviewed him. He mm -hmm. does a great job putting that together and it's what is amazing to me is you you get there's so many energy analysts out there uh, and they probably work for different brokerages and 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 I think what they're doing is they they have to they have to write the analysis that is beneficial to their company and so you see art is an independent he can write whatever he thinks because you know he's an independent and so which is the way I am too so you get more realistic a, a realistic assessment and it, it is true it, it, it's the system, the shale oil, uh, and from what I've seen, the energy return on investment of shale oil is about five to one. Um, I've seen different factors, different different numbers, but it, it comes in at five to one. Now that's at the wellhead. That's at the wellhead. You've got to you've got to move that, transport it, and then you've got to refine it, and then you've got to uh, transport it again to uh, to pipelines and, and to the end product. So when you start adding all that, it even falls even lower. And so uh, we need a much higher energy return on investment to function this very modern U.S. economy. So it just if you look at everything the way you do, Chris, you look at it, uh, you, you pass all the details, and you just look at sim very simply, kind of like Einstein's E equals MC squared, it, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't work. And unfortunately, most analysts get all caught up in, in all the, the details, and I see them and on different blogs writing how, you know, the uh, certain companies like EOG or Pioneer, they're, they're going to do really well in the Permian. I'm thinking you're missing the whole point. The, the system is, is so far in the red, they, they really can't make it out. And so how this unfolds, you know, like I've mentioned, there's a few scenarios, but there's a scenario that to me has a higher and higher probability that we could see a much quicker disintegration of the U.S. and global oil industry than what is forecast to take place, let's say, over the next 15, 20 years. It, it, it could disintegrate much quicker. I'm not saying it will, but it could. I totally agree with this, and, and so I want to uh, turn to – energy return on energy invested and get your take on it, your words. Uh, people have heard my words around it. But in the spirit of that sort of E equals MC squared simplification, I'll just point this out, that, that United States energy oil production uh, of the cheap and easy stuff, that peaked in the early 1970s. Hey, you know what else peaked in the early 1970s was the ability of a single minimum wage earner to support anything that remotely looked like a household or a lifestyle. And so to me, it's a very simple function. If you strip away all the other stuff about economics and tax policy and all that junk, and you just say, listen, really economics is, is just a reflection of the flow of goods and services, which themselves each depend on energy as the lifeblood of that. No energy, no goods, no services is that simple. So just tracking net energy per capita looks like that peaked to me by my numbers somewhere in the early 70s, mid 70s. And wouldn't you know what? That's right around the time people can look back and say that was the last moment when lower and middle income um, lifestyles were, were really possible without borrowing, without debt, without all that stuff. So the energy, the net energy per capita starts to fall. And as a consequence, the response of the system was, well, let's just make it easier and easier for people to borrow. It's really the same story for middle class and lower income people as we see in the shale business, which is if you can continue to borrow, you can mask the trouble for a while. 
But at the first sign of a, of, a, of a cold coming on and that first sneeze, it all falls apart, right? That's 2008, right? And, and that's what's all been masked. And I'm just astonished that this isn't more widely known. Um, you know, before we started recording, I was telling you, I have had opportunities to try and connect energy and economy, those two dots in front of audiences. It's just, it's mind-bogglingly hard considering how mind-bogglingly easy and simple those dots are for me to connect in my head. But in your words, let's talk about energy return on energy invested. Why is this so important for people to understand, and what is it? Well, you know, it's a. Uh, I, I started investing in precious metals in the early 2000s, and uh, but it wasn't until 2008 that I really got interested in the energy. And I've always my brains always worked this way, and I, I guess it's very similar to yours. Uh, I'm I'm not really that smart but I'm very inquisitive. I've got a very high curiosity. Uh, anywhere I go, any job or any uh, company that I've worked with, uh, I, I want to know everything about it. And so going down that venue, you, you see a lot more than most people because you, you get to the root of the problem. And the, the radical is the root, and the energy return on investment is what allows not only plants, animals, humans, corporations, and empires that that is the equation that it has to be a certain amount of plus you have to have a certain positive energy return on investment for all those systems whether it's an it's a single cellular system whether it's a human or an empire you need a certain energy return on investment for that system to function or to move forward when it goes below a certain number and then it it starts it starts cannibalizing itself just like the oil industry is so as well as the U.S. empire is the same thing. So now we're, we're using debt. We're cannibalizing uh, ourselves. And that figure that you gave out, how the uh, income peaked in about 1970s the, per capita, uh, when I interviewed Louis Arnault about the thermodynamics of oil, his figure was for globally, it was in the 19, late, late 1990s. So the globe has actually peaked as well. And, and so now what we're doing, if the net energy is falling, well, people can't afford the same thing anymore because we, we, there's less and less energy getting to the market. So what you do is you extend the payment and you, you make the payment longer or you add more debt. And I've mentioned this in many, in many interviews. It's, there's no coincidence that the uh, U.S. debt is up 23 times since 1980 and the Dow Jones is now up 24 times. And the S&P is up 22 times, and the U.S. retirement market is up 24 times. They're all up about that same ratio as the debt. And so what we have is we have a totally propped-up market based upon debt because the energy isn't producing the, 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 positive, uh, the positive growth, really. So instead of having real economic growth, we're having uh, – inflated economic growth or inflated asset values and so the energy return investment as it fell uh, it was like 30 to 1 in 1970 for the united states and that was still profitable but so what do, what what we had to do and many people will disagree with this but offshoring our manufacturing was a way to extend the u.s lifestyle so we couldn't we couldn't afford the manufacturing anymore because of our oil uh, the energy return on investment. So what we it moved over to other uh, parts of the world where it was cheaper labor, and so what we did is we start you know uh, buying more homes, more things, more stuff, and so and then we went into debt to do that, and that's extended this U.S. So I call it the leech and spend suburban economy. So I agree with you. That is what's happened to offset the falling energy return on investment, and. You know, if you look at it at face value, or just it, it looks like the thing is continuing. People are moving around, buying stuff. A lot of people are traveling, but it's all based on a lot of debt. And when the debt finally implodes, then uh, the whole thing, the real face, the, the real nasty face is shown to the Americans. And I don't think many people are prepared for it. Oh, I totally agree with that. And, um, and I want to drill into this point because it's so important. So I'm going to quote you again. Uh, this is from an article you wrote recently. And you said, I would kindly like to remind all the precious metals investors, as well as those who follow the alternative media, energy is the key problem, not the debt. The debt is a symptom of the falling eroy of energy. For some strange reason, a lot of people still don't get that. We must remember the following debts 
equal unburned energy obligations. Okay, let me let me repeat that. Debts equal unburned energy obligations. Can you explain that, please? Yeah, I think that is probably the most important. If I had to summarize what I do, what you just read there is the most important because I respect a lot of precious metal analysts. Uh, like Peter Schiff, uh, he was one of the few guys out there in 2004, 5, and 6. He was on the mainstream financial networks talking about this whole thing was going to fall apart, and they laughed at him. Well, you know, he basically they cried wolf for three or four years, but in 2007, the, the whole thing fell apart. He was he was right, and I think only one of the uh, hosts actually gave him credit for that. The problem is Peter Schiff does not understand the energy, and, and so when he says we need to let the banks all fall apart or collapse and we can reboot the system, I think if the banks fall apart and the whole system uh, is rebooted, we don't we can't grow out of this. This is not like the 1930s depression where the U.S. was just tapping into its great oil mm-hmm. reserves. No, we, we're well we're, we're well beyond that. So here's the issue. All the assets or supposed assets, which are stocks, bonds, and real estate, and that's where 90, 99%, 98% of the investors invested in the market, that's where they have their funds, in those three assets. Well, those assets, like a stock, is based on net present value. It's like a, it's like a time machine. It gets its, its, its current stock price based upon future earnings. And so... You need energy to burn in the future, not only to keep that stock price elevated, as well as uh, a, a home a home price, real estate. You've, if a lot of people have a 30-year mortgage. Well, you have to work 30 years to pay that mortgage off. So the whole the 98, 99% of the stocks, bonds, and real estate assets out there get their value by what happens in the future. Well, if the oil becomes problematic, and it will, then all of those assets are in big trouble because actually they're energy IOUs. That's the best way to describe them. They're energy IOUs. It's not, it, there's no large pot of gold at the end of the rainbow in, an, in a retirement account. They can't sell the gold and give you your, your, your retirement. You need to burn the energy this year and next year so everybody gets a little percentage of their retirement, uh, of their retirement savings. So, what happens when the oil really starts to fall apart? Well, then the whole thing falls apart, and the values of stocks, bonds, and real estate implode because the energy, profitable energy, really isn't there, Chris. And this is where I look. The reason why I understand and really value the precious metals is because if it's a physical precious metal that's bought and paid for, it is not an energy IOU asset. It is a stored economic energy. Somebody else has to go out and do work or provide you with a good to exchange for that gold or silver coin, which is much different than a stock bond or real estate. It, it, it gets its value by burning energy in the future. The gold and silver coin has its value because it was burned in the production of that gold and silver coin. So it has innate store of value qualities. That idea of embodied energy, super important, but I, I need to, to belabor this other point because it's, it's, just, it's just this important. Um, the the current value of all these trillions of dollars of, of global real estate, debt, and equity, they have part of their in, intrinsic core part of their valuation is the assumption that there's going to be future growth there. The price earnings multiple, and you know, if if price to earnings isn't one, um, you're having some sense that this company is going to be able to grow over time, whether that price earnings is 7, 10, 20, 200, whatever. There's a sense this company is going to grow. So in aggregate, you look at the PE across the price earnings across all the equities, you see that there's this giant collective bet that the future is going to be larger than the present. What you're saying, those unburned energy obligations, that's that's contained as well as in the debt. It's also contained in the in the price earnings ratio. It's it's an assumption. It says, hey, we're good. there's going to be more in the future. Now, as you and I talked about, if you don't have energy, you don't have economy. In fact, if you look at the relationship between economic growth and energy consumption, it is a straight line. It's one of the best, tightest, highly, most highly correlated, in fact, it's causative, um, relationships I have in all of my economic data. It's just, it's the best one. It's like, wow, you, one unit of this leads to some other units of that. But here's the key question, which I'm sure you'll be able to, I'll just put this softball right on the tee for you here. What is the appropriate value for a stock in a bond market compared to today 
if we can all of a sudden assume that future growth goes to zero. I'm not even going to make it fall. It just goes to zero. What happens to valuations under that circumstance, if we're being honest? Honestly, I don't know because we've never been there before. You see, this is the issue. This is what's so fascinating. Uh, we, where we came from, we came from agrarian, and when we moved into new areas, we used the uh, forests or, or the fertile soils, and that was the, the energy return on investment was used there to uh, to continue the economy. And, and it wasn't until recently we got into oil, coal, oil, natural gas, you know, uranium, uh, and now renewables, which unfortunately will never work. Uh, but the, so we have never... We, we we have no idea what the future is going to be like for uh, a system that is so built upon growing energy production. To to maintain the system as well as maintain the asset values, I think once the world realizes growth is over, and you know we continue as you mentioned, we continue to see more oil production. I don't know. I think the number is 97, 98 million barrels, but unfortunately, uh, a good chunk of that is either shale tar sands, natural gas plant liquids, which has 50% of the energy or 60% of the energy of, of crude oil, and it comes at 50% of the price of, of crude oil. So even though we've added a lot of natural gas plant liquids, it looks nice because we, we could say, wow, now we're producing 98 million barrels a day. Well, the, the let's say 15 or 18 million barrels of that is, is low quality. And so it's, it, there's not a lot maybe you can do with some of that. So the problem is that uh, once we realize we cannot grow that, that won't grow anymore. The valuations, and it's going to be, uh, you know, I, I call it precious metal religion. It's going to be like the, uh, the the light bulb is going to go off. And I think it's going to be very quick because at some point, especially if we continue with this 40 or $50 oil, and I think we are because of all the debt, uh, Americans really can't afford high oil prices. So I think what's going to happen when we just start leveling off and maybe start to decline, I think it's going to, you're going to see more of a cliff-like, uh, let's say, reduction in oil production. Uh, it'll come in fits and starts, and that is what is going to shock the markets. And so if you don't have, if you don't have growth, as what you said, you can't eat, you can't have a maintaining or, let's say, a constant oil supply because there's just too much debt. So you have to have a growing oil supply. And you're correct. When it starts to become actually constant and it starts to decline, I think we're going to see the valuations of these assets really decline uh, considerably. And it's anyone's guess how quickly they can fall. But according to what I've been looking at, I think we're going to see uh, a 50% increase in real estate values off the bat. And I'm not saying in a day. That's the first wave. 30 to 50% a decrease in real estate values when we start getting this crack in the markets. And then it'll be like, a, then we'll be at the edge of the cliff. It will fall down a cliff and then, and then we'll walk out and then we'll fall off the cliff again. I, I actually see, Chris, within the next, five to 10 years, we could easily see a 75% or more reduction in real estate values. And, and then what does that mean for stocks and bonds? It's the same thing. So if, if the wild card out there and the probability that we do not have a slow burn, I think we've had the slow burn for eight years, nine years, we start going into more rapid disintegration, you're going to see these valuations of these stocks, bonds, and real estates really decline much greater than anybody has any idea. Well, my flip answer to the what are stocks and bonds worth in a world where all of a sudden the assumption goes to zero is less. I don't know how much less, like you. Like, we haven't right. been here before. We don't know. Like, there's a lot of competing things in a very complex system, and it's psychological and yada, yada, um, but less, right? And so right now, everything's priced for the world as it was the last 70 years is going to be just how it is for the next 70 years. We can just increase debts, but don't worry, you know, growth is going to come back. And, and as you and I understand, the number of people who actually understand that when we say growth is going to come back is really saying energy throughput is going to increase and more subtly that net energy, more net energy is going to be available to the rest of society um, than in the past. And when you dig through that, you just you know, grub around in the data a little bit, you're like, this is impossible. You know, and I know you just tossed it aside and, and said that, you know, renewables aren't the answer, but 
But, you know, and I agree because once you look at renewables, all I see is fossil fuel silently, secretly, maybe not so secretly subsidizing the creation of the aluminum frames and the silicon cells and the giant wind towers and the concrete base with the rebar and all that stuff. That's just all diesel fuel and, and, and fossil fuels. So, so when we get through all of that, the only question that I have to resolve at this point based on my complete analysis and based on the work that you do around energy is energy is the master resource. It's not going to be there in the future like it has been in the past. So the operative question is this, who's going to eat the losses? And that's the battle I see. You got the banks all saying, not us, you know, and you have the government saying, not us, you know, and, and of course the taxpayer ends up uh, taking it in, in, in the shorts in most cases. But that's really the game I see unfolding at this point is who's going to eat the losses. And so, um, you know, given the time we have uh, left where we are in this already, I, I need to turn now to one aspect where I think somebody's trying to get somebody else to eat the losses. I think this is super important. It re revolves around the idea of the petrodollar and Saudi Arabia specifically. Uh, you mentioned before Saudi Arabia's foreign reserves dropping like a rock. But this Saudi IPO for Saudi Aramco, I mean, that looks to me like you just have to be seriously brain dead to buy into that 5% offering valued at $2 trillion, which they're hoping to get 10% for, $200 billion. Uh, talk about that, that IPO real quick and, and how that ties into the petrodollar. I think Saudis aren't stupid. They, and, you know, because a lot of their, their stats are very private, no one really has an idea. And, you know, Matt Simmons uh, did, some, uh, did some great work on it. And some people will say, well, it didn't, you know, it didn't come to fruition. The Saudis are still producing a lot of oil. But I think the issue is the Saudis probably have a lot less reserves than the official amount. And that, that's due to the big 1980s where uh, you know, all these Middle Eastern countries in, artificially increased their reserves so they could export more. And so uh, and if we look at that, and then it, there really hasn't been much since added since that, up, uh, that uh, in, inflated reserve addition. The Saudis really haven't added much more oil reserves. So if you, if you remove that, and then you say, well, they've been producing about 10 million barrels a day, plus or minus. Well, how much are their reserves now? Uh, and, you know, I've seen estimates, uh, maybe 80 billion uh, instead of the 170 or 160 that they state they have. So I think the Saudis realize what they have there is, 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 isn't really what is officially known. And, and, and so the seeing the writing on the wall, and I think they're trying to uh, get something before the system really gets, you know, really starts to disintegrate. And I think Wood McKenzie actually, the, according to their analysis on their IPO, they said it's, it's only worth really 20% of, of, of the value. And, th and that's because of, there's a lot of money uh, of, of the oil that is going to finance the Saudi family as well as the government. So there's not a lot left over for uh, uh, really for an IPO. So, the profitable money from that IPO. So to me, watching the Saudis continually liquidate their reserves, and what's interesting, officially, I think uh, according to the uh, U.S. Treasury data, tick data, there's only 126 or $27 billion worth of U.S. Treasuries that the Saudis have on their, on their books. Well, you see, something's wrong there because most central banks have two-thirds of their uh, of their uh, foreign exchange reserves are in U.S. Treasuries. Now, why does Saudi Arabia only have a, a quarter uh, of their a little less than 500 billion? Why do they only have a quarter of their reserves in, in U.S. Treasuries? And I've read some ana analysis stating that uh, uh, one U.S. Treasury official who understands a lot about uh, the foreign reserves of different countries said that, that the Saudis have probably been purchasing reserves of U.S. Treasuries, but they're in other countries, so they're not going to show up uh, you know, as, as reserves on their balance sheet. So the interesting thing is, Chris, I believe Saudi Arabia is in big trouble. They are putting a lot of, they're, they're injecting a lot of water to produce their oil, and their, their oil or water ratio continues to increase. Their cut continues to increase. This is much different than shale oil. We go down with shale, we dig, we dig down 10, 15,000 feet, and then we do laterals. Well, what Saudi Arabia does, they do these laterals, 
And then when the water cut gets too high, they shut that lateral off and then they drill one even higher. So what they're doing is they're actually moving their laterals closer to the surface because, you know, as we know with oil, oil rises. So uh, at some point in time, I think the production is just going to really collapse because this is not really sustainable. So when we look at all that, we look at the Wood McKenzie saying that the IPO was probably only worth 20%. We look at the Saudis trying to, they say, well, we want to move away from oil. Now, why would they want to move away from oil? They've been doing great for oil for the last 50 years. They realize what they have is, is, is not worth what the, the official market says it's worth. And so I think, I think we're going to see some real excitement in the global oil industry. I really do. I, and if Saudi Arabia, if the, like you say, if the truth comes out about uh, we no longer have growth in the world with uh, oil production, uh, if we find out, if the truth comes out, what's really going on in Saudi Arabia, that's a, that's a, that's a bad deal for their, uh, for their, uh, the, the kingdom that runs everything. You know, we, we could see that fall apart because there really isn't the money there to maintain it now. And so that could destabilize further the Middle East. So it's, I, I tell you, Chris, we're living in very interesting times and it's just going to get even more interesting. Well, it is absolutely going to get interesting. And, and of course, it's rooted in, in something that went by kind of quickly earlier where you talked about, at least in 2016, the only 2.4 billion barrels were found worldwide. But in fact, if you take 2014, 15, 16, that is the lowest three years of oil discovery in my data set that goes but until we get back to the 1920s when the world didn't really know how to explore for oil, right? Uh, so, so it's, you, you know, I don't know why, but the oil people, they keep insisting, Steve, they tell me, Chris, before you pump it, you have to find it. Um, so we have three years of, of the most abysmal finds since the 20s, which you can't even compare the eras and, and, and the amount of oil that's being consumed globally and its importance to sustaining the global piles of debt and the fantasies of growth, infinite growth and all that. So I look at those three years of low growth and I say of low discoveries and I say there's a there's a supply shortfall in the future based on this idea that before you pump it, you have to find it. We didn't find it. I guess we're not pumping it. Right. So so that's the that's the piece there. Now, um, in the time we have left, though, I, we need to turn now. I got to talk about gold and silver. You do some of the best gold and silver analysis out there. And in particular, uh, really beginning to factor in energy into this story. I think you're probably one of the, not probably, you're the only person I know about who's connecting energy and mining in a in this way. So where do we start with this? A lot of people say gold and silver like it's one word. Um, I like to separate them uh, because of stocks and flows, all the gold being above ground, silver having this amazing industrial sets of uses and being consumed um, in large measure. Uh, so silver to me is a fascinating story uh, that's different. Um, than gold, but uh, they share the concept of embodied energy in their production. So let's let's where would you want to start? Gold or silver? You pick, but but start to help our listeners understand why they need to understand how energy begins to tie into that story. There's the Austrian school of economics that basic bases the uh, economic principle of price based upon supply and demand. I used to believe that, and in ways, supply and demand are factors that determine the price of a good, energy, a metal, a service. I'm not talking land, uh, but uh, something that's manufactured, metal that's, that's mined and produced, and as well as energy. There is supply and demand, but it's more of a short term. The, the real value or price of all those is the cost of production. And if we take, and before I get into gold and silver, if we look at the entire market, and we look, look at the healthcare industry, well, let's forget the healthcare. <laughs> I, I was a bad example. All right. uh, let's look at um, auto industry. Let's look at the restaurant industry. Let's look at the, the, the mining industry. Let's look at uh, the auto. All these industries have a margin, like the supermarkets have a very low margin, 1% or 2%. Well, there's no, there, there aren't restaurant chains out there. I mean, there aren't supermarkets out there, uh, you know, uh, enjoying a 15, 15%, 20% margin. It's, there isn't. It's, the comp competition has re regulated itself to where the market now, the margin for the supermarket industry is about 1%, 2%. So all the other stuff, the 98% is the cost to maintain that system. That's, that's the cost of production, all of it. Same thing with copper, 
Same thing with gold and silver. And uh, I'm just, there's two different ways to value things. There's the cost of production as well as the, its uh, uh, store value. Now, gold and silver have been a store value for thousands of years, and money, because of this, uh, the, the energy that it takes to produce uh, an ounce of gold and silver. And I mean, nowadays, people say, well, you know, energy is only like 30% of barracks cost of production. Well, that's true. But then there's uh, like 35% goes to the employees. That's human labor. That's energy. Uh, okay, well, then there's a uh, 25% goes into the capital. Well, if you, if you take all the capital and you bring it to its root cause, the energy was the underlying value that made all that capital, all of it, or, or, or even the supplies like limestone. So to get the limestone from the mine to the gold mine, the, the overriding price of that limestone that they used was the energy. So energy basically is the overriding cost to produce gold and silver. And right now, the cost to produce gold is about between, you know, back of the envelope is 1100 to 1150 And according to my analysis of the primary silver mining industry, it's between 15 and 17 as the industry, let's say 16 So you look at the market price of silver and gold, they're trading at 73 or 72 to 1. You look at the cost of production of gold and silver, and it's about 71, 72 to 1. Now, this was much different, Chris, if we go back before the 19th century, because most of it was done by human and animal labor. So when they pulled it out of the ground and it was 10 to 1, 15 to 1 ratio, that was, that was the guiding principle that gave gold and silver, that 10 to 1, 15 to 1 ratio. But when we brought on oil, we know there's thousands of energy slaves in a barrel of oil, so it changed the dynamics. But when the price of silver starts to move up much higher and its ratio to gold, the ratio falls, what's happening, it's moving away from its com commodity price mechanism, which I call the cost of production, and it's moving more towards its store of value. And so those, those are two different things. And so I, I always look, when people say gold and silver is manipulated, and I'll conclude with this part of it by saying, yes, they're being manipulated. They're being, uh, they're being capped because it's the barometer of the fiat monetary system. But there is a method to the madness by the Fed and central banks. They can't, they can't push that price too far below the cost of production. Traders are too savvy. They're too smart. Uh, and so at, at all the time, and I've looked at the top two gold producers, which is Barrick and Newmont, from 2000 to 2015, their cost of production was always below the market price. Now, silver, a little more volatile. There are certain years the cost of production was a little bit higher than the market price, but not by much. So what we see there is with the actual cost of production is the floor for the price of gold and silver, even though there's lots of gold out there and there's still lots of silver out there. But we're, they're basing it upon the cost of production. And it's the same thing with most everything else. But again, cost of production is the floor. The store of value, to me, will start to hit in gold and silver when the world realizes we don't have growing energy production. And so that's where I see this, this disconnect, or that's where I see the values of the stocks, bonds, and real estates falling, and where I see the precious metals taking off, because there's a realization that one's an energy IOU, as we explained before, and one is a store of economic energy. And so as, as this uh, store of value component comes in, we'll see the ratio begin to close down from 70 to 1 to more uh, long-term 15 to 1, just rounding here a, a bit. And so as it does that, we would expect silver to, to price of silver to climb to catch up to wherever gold happens to be when this finally dawns. Yeah, and a, according to the best analysis I can find, I've looked at like three or four different uh, uh, GFMS, uh, the USGS, and uh, the CPM group. There's about 2.2 billion ounces of gold out there, and, and, and that's investable gold. That's not jewelry or art. That's investable gold that central banks have on their balance sheets. That's also public and private. So if you, if you multiply that by the current market price, you get about $3, billion, uh, $3 trillion. Now, all the silver, this is what's interesting, 
even though there's a lot of silver you know out there moving around uh, there's only about 2.6 billion ounces of silver that is an investment form uh, and of course as we know industry consumes a lot so a lot of it is is still in homes that are still <laughs> a lot of it's in homes and different appliances mm -hmm. that are still being used but if, if they're thrown out there it's not really economic to take the silver out of most of the of the industrial silver so if we look at that Chris we have 2.6 billion ounces of silver compared to 2.2 billion ounces of gold there's not much more silver now more silver could come on the market if the price really escalates but at that point in time I don't think it really will matter because it, 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 there's just not much of real physical silver and gold to, to get one's hands on. And according to my uh, analysis, if you add those two up, it's about $3.1 trillion. And I believe the, 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 the capitalization, or let's say the assets of the world, which is uh, real estate, stocks, and bonds, is about $320 trillion. Uh, and so basically which is that perfect percent that we all realize in the precious metal industry, gold and silver are 1% of all the uh, assets out there. So when you understand that and things start to fall apart, when just 1% of that 300 plus trillion get, wakes up and moves into gold and silver, we, we, we're seeing figures that we just can't imagine. And we don't need to see much more than that, really. I mean, look what's happening in the cryptocurrency market when just the uh, 10 to 50 billions moving into that uh, how it's making those prices really crazy so even though the market the precious metals have been kind of the sentiment has been down uh, sales in the West have been down I think it's kind of like the calm before the storm uh, and it, I'm not saying it's gonna happen this year but at some point in time the market will get precious metal religion because it it, it, it has been the store of value for 2,000 years the Americans just have fiat monetary amnesia since 1970. They they don't understand what is really going on, and unfortunately, uh, there's not many people who are prepared for the future. Sometimes you get amnesia when somebody purposely clubs you on the head. So I think the American financial <laughs> amnesia around gold and silver is because the mainstream media is doing a really heroic job of propagandizing anti precious metal sentiment. Uh, you know, it's just amazing to me every time gold is down a uh, you know, it gets shellacked by something. Wall Street Journal has a gleeful headline. Investors, you know, move away. Like whoever these mysterious investors are that decide to unload, you know, 12,000 contracts at, at 2.58 in the morning, whatever. Um, so uh, just seeing that, I think people have really been, it, but it's not just Western, it's really specifically United States. There's a very different gold and silver sentiment when I go to Europe and talk to people there. Obviously very different in Asia. Uh, I think people listening to this who are in the United States, you need to understand that you live in a regime where your thoughts about precious metals are actively being managed by people who I would consider to be world-class manipulators of opinion. Yeah, that's as gentle as I'm going to put that phrase. Um, and it's been going on for a while. And I understand why, because you said it before, gold and silver... Uh, are barometers of the state of health of the fiat money system. Anybody who peels back the covers on that and looks at, you know, the one plus trillion, one and a half trillion dollars of central balance, central bank balance sheet expansion this year in 2017 by the halfway mark. You know, we're going to have, you mentioned a $3 trillion market roughly for gold and silver. Well, heck, the central banks of just Japan and the ECB are going to put out 3 trillion new freshly printed dollars into the system this year um, if they stay on track. So, crazy times, amazing times. Steve, thank you so much for bringing data to it because I think that's the only way to stay grounded in this ridiculous, this is, keep a journal, everybody. This is the most amazing period of, uh, of social engineering, wealth transfer, and reckless monetary experimentation ever in human history. And you need data to help maintain your bearings in, in uh, such, a, such a crazy time. So, Steve, we're out of time for today. We're going to do this again. I want to dive more deeply into each one of these subjects, plus some others that you've come up with. Before we go, please tell people how to follow your work. Yeah, Chris really enjoyed it. And, and you were right. Uh, if the ECB and, and, and the Bank of Japan purchases $3 trillion, those assets that they purchased could have purchased all the gold investment in the world in a year at two central banks. It's just, just insane. Uh, Really enjoyed the conversation. If anybody is interested to learn, uh, I put out about two or three articles a week, sometimes more, 
at the srsrockreport.com. I do have a few paid reports out there. Uh, I, I put a report out called the Silver Chart Report, and I break down the silver industry and market in five different segments. And I don't think there's a single report out there that provides the d- detail of, of the silver industry and market. But People are more than welcome to come check out. Uh, I try to put out as much original information, and I agree with you. There's a lot of opinion out there. There's a lot of uh, speculation out there. But if we can focus on the changing data, the focus on the changing facts, it it gives us uh, an idea on how things are changing and unraveling. So I really enjoy the conversation, Chris, and look forward to doing it again. Thank you much. We'll talk to you next time.